the uh, title of the uh, weekend that I'll be giving here at CIIS is Ethnobotany and Shamanism, Psychedelics Before and After History. This is the third year that I've lectured at CIIS, a course which uh, the core content is a survey of the psychedelic plants of planet Earth and the cultures that have used them and then discussion of their chemistry, uh, geographical distribution, uh, history of usage, impact on the growth of ideas and historical institutions and so forth. It's basically an effort to pack a psychobotany course into a weekend and it is always preceded by this Friday night lecture in which I attempt to give uh, an overview and a sort of state-of-the-art report on psychobotany and why anyone should uh, place any importance upon it. So I sort of think of this lecture as uh, the philosophical implications of psychobotany past, present, future. So that is the theme that will guide the uh, lecture this evening. For me personally, it has been an experience of uh, never being able to really anticipate the direction in which this line of thought would develop. It seems to have a life of its own, uh, a richness of its own, uh, that is not predictable by the conscious mind. A few, uh, about three years ago, I began trying to uh, think about feminism and what role it had, if any, to psychedelics and the role they had played in shaping culture. And uh, it, it seemed at the time uh, to my critics and to some degree to me that it was almost a kind of opportunism it's such a safe issue to clothe yourself in that uh, no matter what you're doing, if you can make it part of the feminist agenda, you, you somehow have become inviolate. It now seems to me that um, this thread in thinking about the sh impact of shamanic and specifically visionary shamanism's impact on culture it has grown in my own mind uh, more and more important. The rise of the consciousness of Gaia, which is the notion of the planet as at, at the very least a self-regulating system and uh, possibly at the other end of the scale as actually a kind of conscious intellect, a kind of super being or oversoul that by the control of planktonic uh, uh, populations on the surface of the sea can regulate rainfall and thus control the density of vegetation on the continents and thereby regulate the composition of the atmosphere and by a series of interlocking, interwoven feedback loops actually create a kind of biological or organic homeostasis which is the precondition for the evolution of uh, advanced organisms. And this idea of Gaia or, or of perceiving the earth as a living organism has been, uh, I think, the intellectual or philosophical centerpiece of what feminism uh, has done with its agenda in the last uh, 15 years or so. But this enthusiasm for the goddess this enthusiasm for the seamless web of life has not yet clarified itself as a philosophical intention sufficiently to draw certain obvious conclusions about the relationship that it should have to shamanism number one and most specifically to psychedelic shamanism. Now why? What is the connection there? 
Well, what I would like to suggest is that the condition of cultural neurosis in which we as moderns reside might operationally be described as uh, ego inflation. And that specifically it is the masculine ego that is inflated. Now, the cause for this has been sought by various different commentators on culture, but none of them have suggested that the uh, tumorous growth of the masculine ego as a cultural and individual institution uh, is specifically due to the absence of uh, the dissolving agency of psychoactive ecstasy induced by plants. Do you, do you see where I'm going with this? <clears throat> so that, in fact, the modern enthusiasm for shamanism and secondarily or in a connected mode with psychedelics is actually an intuitive feeling back toward this state of non-neurotic empathy that characterized archaic time. And that is what has specifically been lost by the descent into the historical process. And this notion that there is, that something was lost which is tangible then allows us to set a radical reconstructive agenda for society. Because if what was lost was tangible, rather than say the goodwill of God Almighty, which is not something tangible, and that's the culture myth, that we lost the goodwill of God Almighty, so we had to leave Eden and descend into toil. Uh, but notice that if we take the story of Eden more seriously, more literally, what we're dealing with is a uh, struggle over use and abuse of available uh, psychoactive compounds in the Edenic environment. And that in fact, the challenge to Yahweh was the challenge of the woman who sought to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, to have the knowledge of good or evil, which would place the, the man and the woman on an equal footing with God. And this aspiration to gnosis, this desire to transcend the ordinary and penetrate into the realm of existential truth was enough to get them canned out of Eden. Now I want to cast further back into time and sort of lay the groundwork for this case about the, uh, the male ego. But before I do that, I want to ask you to uh, review in your own mind for a moment certain curious facts about the religions of Western culture, the tradition of monotheism, as it's practiced in the West. First of all, this is the only, and any student of myth who wishes to correct me is welcome to do so, this is the only theogony, the only God system that I know of in which uh, the head honcho has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with women, does not have a mother, <laughs> does not have a consort, does not have a daughter. It's a locker room religion <laughs> from the get-go. <laughs> now it was uh, the uh, insight of Carl Jung and his school uh, to understand that myths are narcissistic reflections of our own aspirations as individuals and societies. And when you look at the monotheistic hypostatization of God with omnipotence, 
omniscience, all power, all moral suasion, everything is held in the hands of the Father God, who is characterized by wrath and an obsession with uh, punishment and with the carrying out of uh, what are essentially punishments related to taboos. In other words, sins which are not clearly sins for any reason other than that they are forbidden. And this model of God became the model for the personalities, the atomic personalities that were creating the civilizations that worshipped in this fashion. In other words, that became a way to be omniscient, omnipresent, brooking no opposition, swift to punish, stern in all demands, so forth and so on. And this shift, and it was a shift because the pre-pottery Neolithic level in the Middle East seems very clearly and generally to be a goddess culture, a religion based on, uh, on pastoralism and uh, a large amount of gathering integrated into hunting. That goddess-oriented wandering pastoral religion gave way to the fixed settlement, Neolithic, male-dominated model that in its many adumbrations has persisted into the present moment. Well, as I said, I believe the reasons for this lie further in the past in the moments of human emergence that occurred 15, 20,000 years before the appearance of the goddess cultures in the ancient Near East. It, the, the critical moment, I believe, uh, occurred in Africa during the process of the desertification of the African continent. The previously arboreal pack hunting or arboreal primates descended onto the grasslands, which was an environment of increased nutritional pressure. And there, bipedalism, binocular vision, the opposable thumb, which had probably existed earlier, all these things were channeled into creating a highly efficient, omnivorous, pack hunting creature. And the, the key word here is omnivorous. One of the great and unexplained lacunas in modern evolutionary theory is that evolutionary primatologists have not made any attempt to discuss the impact on human evolution of changes in diet, which were uh, uh, swift and unusual in this evolving grassland situation. Let me explain what I mean. Uh, most animals have a very selective and restricted diet. So consequently, whatever the chemical composition of that diet, over millions of years of exposure, the animal forms a, a relationship of, ex of adaptability to whatever its food source is. When an animal population becomes omnivorous under uh, pressure on the availability of nutrition, suddenly the animal begins to test for possible food sources in the environment. Well, this testing for food sources in the environment introduces a vast number of mutagenic compounds into the body, into the bodies of these animals, not only psychoactive compounds, but uh, depressants, stimulants, things which interfere with RNA transcription, things which uh, enhance or suppress the immune system, things which retard or clarify vision, things which suppress appetite, things which uh, interfere with the estrus cycle. Uh, remind yourself for a moment that orthonovum and the birth control pills are uh, all derived, the, the compounds in those pills are derived from Dioscoria 
plants grown on hu in huge plantations in Mexico, uh, the kind of tropical yam. Well, yams in the tropics are now and always have been a major food source for foraging primates. And yet some varieties of yams contain so much of these uh, uh, hormone-like substances that they send the reproductive cycle and ovulation and all these things just into a tizzy. Well, you can imagine the impact, the evolutionary speed up that this decision to go omnivorous would have on these uh, evolving primates. And I maintain that uh, the prolongation of infantile traits in human beings, some of which persist throughout our entire lives, such as our, uh, that too. I was, <laughs> I was thinking of uh, our, our relative hairlessness and stuff like that. But, <laughs> You're right, it's a puzzle. Every generation thinks that the generation which, uh, uh, f which it spawns is more infantile yet than it was. <laughs> and somebody wrote me a letter recently suggesting that this was a good thing and it would end with us simply skipping the life in 3D phase and you would just go from fetus to chip and skip over uh, this whole messy three-dimensional cultural phase. Um, but I digress. 